Okay, let me start out by saying that I would uh, very much appreciate an interactive session. I have uh, given this lecture many, many times, and uh, all the material I will be presenting, it already has been published, and actually it's used widely in the electrophysiology community. Um, it's also going to be a quite conceptual presentation. Uh, it's not going to be so much about the actual procedures that uh, people uh, uh, nowadays typically apply when they run statistical analysis, more about the concepts uh, behind it. And I learned over the past years that uh, the concepts that uh, we use, uh, which we have implemented in particular procedures, that these concepts are uh, not always intuitive. And um, intuitive is a, is a intuition is a relative thing. It, intuition depends on the degree to which a particular new uh, information, piece of information, fits with your uh, pre-existing concepts. And I found out that the pre-existing concepts with which uh, neuroscientists enter the room um, are typically different from the concepts that uh, I have been using. So, so for you, in order to profit uh, from this session, try to update your concept. I should say not to update, but to enlarge the concepts. So most of you have been trained in uh, bachelor level courses uh, on statistics, and you will find out that uh, uh, statistical concepts I will be using are slightly different. At the same time, I will also cover um, statistical concepts that are more mainstream, uh, such that you can compare. But please interact with me. So this is about concepts, so it's not about actual procedures. The procedures follow from the concepts in a quite natural, natural way. Yeah. Okay, so this is the outline of my talk. I'll start out with the obvious question, why do we actually need statistics in neuroscience? And uh, in answering that question, I will make a distinction between inferential statistics and data analysis, because I will only be covering one of the two. And then I will uh, use a very particular but very unknown statistical test. It's called the inter or interocular traumatic test. I will use that test to um, make a case for why statistics is essential for neuroscience. And I will uh, make the point that inferential statistics, which is going to be the topic of the day, is principled decision-making under uncertainty. And that's where the conceptual uh, focus starts. Uh, so I will focus on this decision-making process and what are the principles that you can use to take uh, uh, rational decisions under uncertainty. And then I will introduce two particular approaches, of which one you know quite well. It, I call it the Neyman Pearson approach, because those are the two people that are to be credited for those ideas. But you all know of them. There are null hypothesis, alternative hypothesis, false alarm rate, sensiti sensitivity, uh, p-value, decision on the basis of p-value, multiple comparison correction, all of that, it's all part of the Neyman Pearson framework. And I will introduce another approach, which is conceptually quite different. It's called the permutation-based approach, and I will compare the two. And I will outline relative advantages and disadvantages. Okay, first question, why do we need statistics in neuroscience? And um, the answer is that statistics helps us in making decisions under uncertainty. And this particular branch of statistics we call inferential statistics. And we all know it via its tools, uh, the statistical tests, like a t-test, a z-test, an f-test, chi-square test. You know. Those are the tools of inferential statistics. All these tests are based on a p-value, and a decision is being taken on the basis of the p-value. Now, there is, uh, there is also a, uh, a part of uh, statistics which I will not cover, and that is statistics, a uh, part of statistics that uh, produces and evaluates methods that reveal patterns in the data which you cannot identify by eyeballing. Yeah. And that's a part we call data analysis. And here are some examples. Principal component analysis, factor analysis, um, uh, the, Fourier, the Fourier transform. For some people, this is uh, a, a domain of statistics, although signal processing people might disagree. But it's Fourier analysis is a typical example of a method that you can use to identify patterns in the data, which you are unable to see if you would just look at the raw data that comes out of an EEG or an MEG machine. And there are many more. There is 
There is the classification approaches like support factor machines. You have ICA in about 120 different flavors. They're all methods. They're not used for decision making, but they're used for getting more out of your data. Actually, source reconstruction is also something like uh, You could also consider source reconstruction as a, uh, as a data analysis method. In a, in a broad sense. Yeah. But I will not cover that. I will only look at inferential statistics, only about decision making. Now, so why do we need statistics in neuroscience? Why do we need inferential statistics in neuroscience? And the, and the simple answer is that the interocular traumatic test fails so very often. Now, what is the interocular traumatic test? It has been proposed by a famous statistician, Bergson. He's actually a very serious guy, but once in a while he makes a joke. And now he made a joke. But it's a joke that gives you the appropriate intuition. Yeah. He said, when you use the, in the way to use the interocular traumatic test is as follows. You look at the data, and when you do that, the conclusion hits you right between the eyes. So that doesn't work in statistics. And why, and why doesn't it work? I will come to that in the next slide. But in order to show you a case where the interocular traumatic test works, and therefore you do not need a formal inferential test, is this one. Let's assume you have a sample of 20 participants. It's an MEG study. And all these 20 <coughs> participants, they show exactly the same difference pattern, difference between two conditions, A and B. And the difference pattern is identical across the participants, of over the participants, both with respect to the spatial dimension. So it's this, the same MEG sensors uh, that show the difference. It's the same frequency band. And it's also the same time interval. All these 20 participants show the same difference with respect to the spatial, with respect to the spectral, and with respect to the temporal dimension. If you look at those data, yeah, you may calculate a p-value, uh, because the reviewer wants you to calculate the p-value, but the pattern is so consistent over all subjects, you're not doubting anymore. Uh. So if you use a statistical test, it's only because this is the routine, this is the procedure. It's not because you really have a question. You actually, you know it. Uh, the pattern is so very clear. Yeah. And if the pattern is so clear, there is no uncertainty. And if there is no uncertainty, yeah, then why should you invest so much energy in, in cooking up a formal statistical test? Yeah. And that's the point that Bergson made. So it's a very legitimate point. Statistics starts when you are uncertain. So, in line with that, the interocular traumatic test, it fails so often because either the observer is uncertain about the conclusion that can be drawn, that is you sitting in front of your screen, looking at the data from uh, different subjects or different sessions, and you're not really sure whether something systematic is going on or not. So that's one scenario. The other scenario is that there are um, different opinions across different observers with respect to the conclusion to be drawn on the basis of the data. And typically, the different observers, one of them is the author of a paper and the other one is a reviewer. The author thinks there is some pattern in the data and the other observer is the reviewer. He doesn't think that that pattern is in the data. Yeah? So there is disagreement on the basis of what can be inferred from the raw data. Is there really a pattern in the data or is, this is it not? And that's the point where a formal statistical test can be of help because there is uncertainty. So that's the point. It starts with uncertainty. Okay. Next question. Why does that interocular traumatic test fail so often in neuroscience? There are two reasons. The first one is that the signal-to-noise ratio of many measurements, and that holds both for electrophysiological or um, bolt-related measures, that SNR ratio is very small, especially at the signal trial level. Every one of you have already done an uh, electrophysiology experiment, and uh, if you look at the screen to see your ongoing EEG, and then you s also see the markers, uh, the markers of your stimulus, uh, stimuli you present. 
initially, when, I, when this was f my first experiment, I was expecting to see an evoked response in the ongoing data when there is a stimulus presented. No way. <laughs> Don't see an evoked response. It, it's the averaging that produces the, evo the evoked response. Uh, same holds for fMRI. Uh, you need many repetitions of events uh, uh, to see a particular phenomenon. If you do uh, recordings on single neurons, that's different. That's different. Yeah. You can poke in a single neuron and present a stimulus to a monkey, and then you will see at a single trial level, you can very clearly hear the firing rate going up. But with the measures that, the extracranial measures that we use, the SNR is fairly low. That's the way it is. Second, the measurements that we obtain um, in uh, human neuroscience are typically high-dimensional data structures which you cannot compare on the basis of visual inspection alone. Yeah. Typically, if you measure uh, EEG or MEG, yeah, and you do a statistical uh, comparison between two experimental conditions, you have one comparison for every sensor time pair, time pair if you do this in the time domain, and you ha uh, it becomes even worse if you add a spectral dimension. If you make a time frequency representation, I think yesterday was time frequency, or, or the first day you had talked about time frequency <laughs> representation, you can go from spatial temporal data to spatial spectral temporal data. So you have three, dimen three dimensional arrays, which you then have to compare between different experimental conditions. So that's huge. Uh, that's not something that the eye can do uh, any, uh, any more easily, especially if you have to combine information across multiple subjects. And the same actually uh, same holds for fMRI. fMRI is, uh, also comes with intrinsically three-dimensional data structures. You don't have to do uh, spectral analysis to insert a third dimension. The data are just recorded in 3D. Every voxel corresponds, uh, 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 corresponds to a point in a three-dimensional space. Next question. Is there something like statistics for neuroscience? And the simple answer is no. Uh, I think the general principles of statistical decision making also apply to neuroscience. So the concepts that we use, the concepts are just the same as the ones that uh, have been introduced by statisticians for uh, statistical analysis of uh, much smaller problems, typically scalar data, uh, comparing the lengths uh, of uh, subjects in in two groups, or typically it, it comes from it comes from agriculture uh, experiments, agriculture experiments. Uh, is the is the yield higher with this fertilizer as compared to that fertilizer? And those are typically scalar observations. But the concepts for dealing with the uncertainty uh, in those experiments, those concepts we also use. However, neuroscience has its own statistical problems and they require specialized methods. So the concepts are the same, but the procedures that we imply, they are, um, mm, the procedures are specific for the particular type of data that we collect. Yeah. I will come to that later. Now, and these statistical problems, they, um, they mainly result from the high dimensionality of typical neuroscience data. Actually, it's only with the coming of uh, uh, neuroimaging or uh, human electrophysiology and neuroimaging that uh, statisticians were challenged to, to deal with statistical inference on the basis of high-dimensional data structure. Yeah. If you look at old statistics books, it's only about scalar observations, yeah. which, which were good for cognitive psychology for many years because typically every trial gives you a reaction time and accuracy or a left-right button press. Typically, the data in a, in a behavioral experiments are fairly you know, limited. Two numbers at most, reaction time and choice. Yeah. And now, you, now we go to EEG, and then suddenly we record uh, one second of data, and we have here with the MEG system, we have 275,000 numbers in one second. And we used to have two numbers. That's a huge difference. So that brings us to the modal comparison problem. These huge, huge data sets inevitably come with the huge risk of uh, type 1 error rate <coughs> inflation. Yeah? Yeah? Yeah. So is that clear for you, the multiple comparison problem? I should, yeah? Okay. Okay, now what is uh, inferential statistics? It is principal decision making. That's an important starting point, and it's also a, it's a starting point that it makes us humble. And, it, and it, 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 it ensures that we are not 
stretching our expectations with respect to what statistics can provide to us. Yeah. And actually the slide actually already ends with the statement statistics is not about the truth. Yeah. So many people, uh, they have a tendency to treat it as uh, n um, the golden route to the truth. And it's not like that. It's, it's useful, but it's not the route to the truth. It doesn't work like that. So what does it do? So inferential statistics is decision-making based on rational principles. That's important. Huh? So it's not subjective. It's, it's extremely rational. It's extremely rational. However, a neuroscientist can choose between multiple rational principles. So there are multiple rational principles huh? o uh, which, on an a priori from an a priori point of view, huh? if you would be a philosopher of science, you would probably think all of these different rational decision-making principles, they all make sense. Eh? If you look at them, each of them individually, you would say, yes, that makes sense. I think I would like to do inference on the basis of that principle. But then, in practice, if you would follow procedures which are driven by different multiple rational principles, you can arrive at different conclusions. Yeah. That can happen. Yeah. And that is something for a statistician, this is unavoidable. A statistician is not a philosopher. A philosopher is a man who, or, or a woman who thinks about what are uh, sensible, internally consistent, rational decision-making frameworks. So you have people that think about what, uh, Bayesian inference from a more philosophical point of view. You also have frequentist inference. It's a different type of philosophy. And people discuss this in the absence of data. Huh? Is this a good principle? Once you choose a principle, then you can start with procedures. Yeah? And these procedures all produce p-values, and from the p-values you then get, an, get a conclusion, yeah? draw a conclusion. But the principles, there is a room of choice there. Yeah? And people can very much disagree at that high level. Now, philosophers don't give you tools, statisticians give you tools. But statisticians only give you tools for a particular rational decision uh, making principle at the time. I will discuss two principles with you today. So here is a list of the four which are most popular in neuroscience. There's a name on Pearson approach. I'll explain this in a minute. You, you know the concepts. There is false discovery rate control. <coughs> I will not, discu not discuss this. Then there is the permutation based approach. I'll also spend time on that. And then there is the Bayesian approach. I'll say nothing about it, even though it's quite popular. Huh? But it's a, it's a totally different and also internally very consistent um, decision-making um, framework. But many people don't like it. Eh? And many, don't, many people don't like it because there is uh, the prior distribution, which also has an, uh, an impact on your, um, on your decision. In principle, by taking the prior distribution a narrower and narrower, you can drive your posterior distribution anywhere. Eh? And many people, many, many, especially people with, which have an empirical, or, uh, an empirical slant, they don't like working with prior distributions. They want everything has to come from the data. There is a lot to be said about it. There are also some things to be said about the Bayesian approach. But there are extreme, there are extreme proponents of, uh, of both principles. For now, you have to be aware there are multiple of these pr uh, uh, principles to be used. So we go for Neyman Pearson and permutation-based approach, and I will focus on how these approaches deal with the multiple comparison problem. Now, for each of these two principles, I will do the following. First, as, and that should be very simple, I will just illustrate the procedure. Huh? So what do you actually do with the data? Huh? I will illustrate the procedure by means of a very simple example. And I will not take a neuroscience example, I just take scalar observations. Single, every trial gives me a single number. Could be reaction time, could be an accuracy. And if you really want to think in terms of electrophysiology, just assume that you have an EEG setup, huh? where you have one electrode, of course you have a reference electrode, and you have an electrode of interest, huh? and you record the electrical potential at one time point relative to stimulus onset. And you have, to have scalar observation. Then the next step, I will explain the rationale behind the procedure, and I will show how the multiple comparison problem is solved, and I will evaluate the solution. So how, uh, so how does the Neyman-Pearson uh, approach work? 
The approach always starts with formulating a so-called null hypothesis. And the null hypothesis is formulated in terms of unknown population parameters. And typically you have uh, two populations of interest, and then the null hypothesis is like the difference between the expected values in the two populations uh, is equal to zero. So the expected values in the two populations are equal. So if this would be a, a single channel, single time point EEG experiment, it would say the, uh, the electrical potential uh, measured at this time point uh, with, this with this electrode, that electrical potential is identical in condition A uh, as compared to condition B. Yeah. Next, you take some test statistic. And this could be, for example, the two-sample t-statistic. Now, if you again take this one-channel uh, EEG uh, experiment, you could, ha you could have you know, two scenarios. Either you have a single subject or you have more subjects. Uh, let's start with a single subject. A single subject whom you have given trials in two experimental conditions, for instance, a visual stimulus, which is expected versus a stimulus that is unexpected, and you want to know something about if the electrical potential 200 milliseconds after the stimulus measured here over the vertex, front frontal part of the vertex, you know something about that, and then you can see whether attention has an effect on that uh, potential. And then you make, you make a two sample t-statistics, and the replications here are the trials. Within every subject, you have several hundred of trials. You have, say, 200 in condition with attention and 300 without condition. You could use a two sample t-statistic to evaluate the difference. Could also be a study where you have patients and controls, uh, and then for every uh, subject, uh, you have this average. Now you take the average over the trials within a subject, then you have an average electrical potential uh, for the patients and you have an average electrical potential for the controls and you evaluate whether that average electrical potential is different between the two populations. Use two sample t statistics for that. Next, you find a critical value for the test statistic such that under the null hypothesis formulated in, number in one that the probability of exceeding this critical value is controlled. Uh, and controlling that probability it means that you can set uh, a probability that you will not exceed under the null hypothesis. Uh, so if the null hypothesis is true, uh, then this, um, this, a, this, 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 this critical value is chosen such that you will not exceed that, uh, that low probability of um, uh, incorrectly uh, rejecting the null hypothesis. And this critical value, you define this by a critical p-value under the sampling distribution. Yeah. So, the, um, so this, 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 this nominal alpha value, it's, uh, it can also be called a critical p-value. Yeah. It's, uh, it, it, it's, 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 it's uh, the, 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 it's the, the proportion of, uh, uh, of the proportions of replications in which you. Uh, would accept that the null hypothesis is uh, incorrectly rejected. So now the word replications brings up the name sampling distribution. So this, this, this Neyman-Pearson uh, uh, approach, it is based on the uh, conception that you can uh, redo your experiment under, ad under identical conditions. Redoing your experiment under identical conditions, it means redoing your experiment under the null hypothesis. So that's the idea. The idea is that I now have I have done one experiment, I have these data, now what would happen if I would redo this experiment and the null hypothesis were true? Yeah. Yeah. So if I, would, if I would redo my experiment under the null hypothesis, and each time I would calculate this two-sample t-statistic, yeah. and if I would make the probability distribution of that t-statistic over these hypothetical replications under the null hypothesis, I would get the sampling distribution. Sampling distribution is just the distribution of your t-statistic under replications for which the null hypothesis holds. That's the way it works. And you take a critical p-value under the sampling distribution. Yeah? You can show that if you reject only if the p-value is less than, the nom than some nominal value, then the probability of rejecting the null hypothesis, whereas in fact it's, it's true, that probability is exactly equal to that nominal value that you choose 
as your decision criterion. That's the, lo that's the logic of Neyman Pearson. Now, the approach also has some constraints, and uh, um, these constraints <coughs> are not so important if you work with scalar observations, but they become terribly important if you work with high dimensional data. So first, if you, if you use the Neyman Pearson approach, then you must know the sampling distribution. Actually, what I say here in the first sentence, the probability distribution of the test statistic under the null hypothesis, it's just another way of saying the sampling distribution. The sampling distribution has to be known because you calculate your p-value under the sampling distribution. So you must know the sampling distribution. And that's a difficult thing. That's not, that's not simple. Huh? So, uh, so you, if you have a particular null hypothesis, expected value equal to a and b, and you calculate the t-statistic, now, what is, the t what is the probability distribution of that t-statistic under that null hypothesis? Well, it turns out if, that if I only formulate my null hypothesis of interest, equal expected values, that is not sufficient to derive the sampling distribution. Uh, for this task to become manageable for the mathematical statistician, they have to assume auxiliary assumptions. And here are the ones that you know, normality. They assume that the data come from a normal distribution. Also that in the two conditions, the variance is equal. And also that all the data are statistically independent. Only if they assume that, uh, if only if they make those assumptions, then uh, they know what is the sampling distribution. Yeah. And of course, these assumptions may be false. Now, to the defense of Neyman Pearson uh, approach, I must say that in the scalar case, we have something like the uh, central limit theorem. The central limit theorem tells us that if uh, the number of observations increases, then the probability distribution or the sampling distribution of my uh, t-statistic, the sampling distribution of the t-statistic becomes more and more normal. Yeah. 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 Regardless of whether these auxiliary assumptions hold or not. Uh, so these auxiliary assumptions, they are required uh, to have exactly the sampling distribution that you use to calculate your p-value. Uh, no other way. However, if you're wrong uh, and your sample size is large, it's not so bad. Uh, for the scalar observation case. For the scalar case, it's not so bad. Uh, so now there's no absolutely no reason for you to stop using uh, uh, t-statistics for, for, for low dimensional or for scalar observation is perfectly okay to use. Okay, that about auxiliary assumptions. Next, a second constraint is that we want our test statistic to be sensitive. And that means that under the alternative hypothesis, we want the probability of exceeding the critical value to be large. So under the alternative hypothesis, we also want to reject the null hypothesis. Yeah? So we need a powerful test statistic. And not every test statistic is powerful. Yeah? So uh, uh, the, the aspect of sensitivity, um, which is often overlooked in the case of uh, scalar observations, the aspect of sensitivity will become very important with high dimensional data sets. And the idea is that it doesn't really make a lot of sense to only control the false alarm rate if you do this by means of a test statistic which is not sensitive for uh, the type of uh, effect uh, that you're interested in. I will return to that. So how does the uh, Neyman Pearson approach uh, work in practice? So I, I, have, I must introduce some variables here. I'll start here with the right. So I denote my data by D, capital D, and I also have a small d. Yeah. I will start with the small d. The small d are actual numbers. Small d's are numbers and big d's are random variables. So I will come to the difference between them in a minute. So my numbers here, I denote them small d, and I, have, and I, 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 uh, I organize them in a single vector. And I have two experimental conditions, capital A and capital B. And in every condition, I have small n numbers. So I have here a vector of two times small n numbers. Yeah. Those are all my data. 
Now I also have a corresponding vector with big Ds. And big Ds, they are random variables. I use a big D to denote that my small Ds are actually the result of a random process. I have randomly drawn numbers from some population. It can be a within participant population of trials or it can be a th they can be two populations of subjects. It doesn't really matter, but there is a random aspect. It's only because we believe that there is some random aspect in the data that we care about statistical testing at all. Uh, if you would assume the data to be uh, uh, constants, we would not do testing. We only, so, so we naturally think about data as the result of a natural process. And the price to be paid is that we have to make a distinction between capital D and small d. Small d are the numbers with which we, with which we, that we use in our calculations, but in our thinking, we also have the big D. The big D is that it's a, it's a variable. Huh? It's like something like if you tap the big D on the head, it produces a small D. And if you tap it the second time, it produces a sm second small D. Yeah. That's how you can look at it. A D, a capital D, is a box. And if you hit it, a new set of numbers gets generated. Okay, now what is the null hypothesis? Null hypothesis is always denoted here in this, uh, uh, this rectangle with rounded corners. The null hypothesis states that the random variable is, uh, is produced um, by a probability distribution which has equal expected values for the first n numbers and the second n numbers. Uh, so the expected value for for all of these d's is equal to the expected values for all of these d's. That's the null hypothesis. That's the null hypothesis. Yeah. Null hypothesis is always in this box. Uh, so the expected value of those numbers is equal to the expected value of those. That's the null hypothesis. And then there are some auxiliary assumptions, like equal variance. Uh, if I would calculate the variance over those, then that would be equal to the variance of, uh, of those. And also, they are normally distributed. Every D is a draw from a normal distribution. Yeah. I put them between brackets because they are not really of interest from a scientific point of view. A neuroscientist doesn't care about normality or equal variance. He has an interest in the expected values, not in uh, anything. But he has to do some. So the station has to make assumptions about. Yeah. So that's why they're all here in this box. Okay. And now, how how does the statistical inference works? It starts by drawing the observed data. Uh, so you hit the random variable once, and then you get this, uh, this black D. Uh, you also have gray Ds, they will come later. So you have one black D. Uh, you have this one black D, and with that one black D, you can calculate a, a test statistic. S is my uh, two-sample T statistic here. Yeah. So, um, and this uh, two-sample T statistics has two input uh, uh, arguments. There is the data, and there is also this vector i. This vector i is my independent variable. Uh, and the independent variable tells me that the first n elements come from one condition, and the second n elements come from the other condition. Uh, if I would only give my test statistic d, statistic would not know which of these two n elements correspond to one condition and which to the others. So i is an indexing variable. The ind uh, independent variable typically is an indexing variable. It tells you uh, to which condi condition a particular biological data set belongs. Yeah. Okay, so then you have here your uh, uh, test statistic. It's a t statistic. And the t-statistic will be evaluated under some reference distribution. And I already told you that reference distribution is the sampling distribution of the t-statistic under the null hypothesis. So how uh, can we conceptualize this visually? It is, we, it is tapping on that random variable d and asking it to produce new numbers. Huh? And, every, and every time I tap, I get this gray d with a hat, and I have an index, an index running. Every time I tap, that index gets higher. These gray Ds are not actually realizing them myself, but these gray Ds, they exist in the mind of the statistician. The statistician conceptualizes an hypothetical experiment where he replicates uh, original data, 
under the null hypothesis. So every time he taps, he gets a new realization of 2 times n normally distributed random variables, equal variance, uh, and then he uses them, puts them into a t-statistic, and then that t-statistic, because you have so many numbers, uh, actually forms a probability distribution. And that's the probability distribution. If I have an infinite number of of these uh, replications or uh, of my uh, experiment under a null hypothesis, I get a uh, smooth probability distribution. And uh, what I then do is I take my observed test statistic and I evaluate whether that uh, value of a test statistic is, uh, is rare under the null hypothesis. Basically, I evaluate how far it is in the tail area. If it is very far in the tail area, then I say, hmm, it's quite unlikely uh, that this data set D, that this, this black D, comes from the same distribution that has generated the gray Ds. And the gray Ds, I know, they all come from the, uh, <coughs> they all come from under the null hypothesis. That's the logic. And the same logic, sure, ask me. Yeah, if your normality is within conditions and if you evaluate equal variance, should you compare between the conditions. Yeah. And is there a big difference uh, with respect to testing normality on the residuals after the test statistic? Yeah, it's based on the residuals, yeah. It's based on the, yeah. That's what people, th th there, is, there are books have been written about uh, uh, how to evaluate whether these auxiliary assumptions hold. Um, uh, uh, I never use them, because first, the central limit theorem is extremely strong, is extremely strong. And if you have reason to doubt whether the central limit theorem applies, there are a few cases where you can doubt them. Huh? If that is the case, you must use a non-parametric test. I will give you a non-parametric test which does, not which does not assume any auxiliary assumptions at all, and it's always exact. So. I do use uh, a parametric t statistic uh, regu regularly, and I trust it because, yeah, I have done some experiments uh, to see how quickly the uh, uh, central limit theorem results in convergence to normality, and it's extremely fast. Yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't worry too much. A situation is different in high dimensional data. I mean, the situation is terrible with high dimensional data, and as neuroscientists, we only have high dimensional data. So this central limit theorem is not very useful for us. That's a big problem. Yeah. I'll, I'll come to that. Yeah. Okay, now let's come to these high dimensional data. This high dimensional data, and that brings the multiple comparison problem. Huh? So, um, instead of having in every trial one observation, or one number, you now have 275,000 numbers if you record one second of MEG data at a sampling rate of uh, uh, one kilohertz. Okay, so how so how does the Neyman Pearson approach deal with the multiple comparison problem? And you should put yourself in the mind of a statistician who his whole life has been working with agricultural data, and now in his uh, in his university there is a neuroscience group starting somewhere in the beginning of the 70s, and they have EEG, and they come for advice to him. And they say we want to test for uh, statistical significance of the difference between two conditions and we have whole brain EEG yeah? and we have an interest in both the spatial and temporal aspect. How would that guy go about? And this is what this is what these people did. What they did is they formulated null hypotheses in terms of unknown population parameters at all elements of the multivariate random variable D. Yeah? So D is now not a scalar anymore. D is it's a spatio-temporal matrix, 275 by 1,000. Huh? Um, could also be triplets if you have uh, uh, frequency dimension inserted. Huh? Yeah. And, and it's, and it's, it's more like a cube-like a cube -like structure. Now, for each uh, cell in that high-dimensional array, there is an expected value. Yeah? And you have not one array, you have two arrays, one for condition A, and one for condition B. Yeah. And now, the natural generalization 
of the null hypothesis for the scalar case is that you now say that these now assume or that you now want to test the null hypothesis that the expected values in all of the cells of these two high dimensional data structures condition A, condition B that they are equal to each other yeah. and that's what most people have been doing uh, in the beginning also especially dominated by the fMRI people they first started using this so they so for them the three dimensional structure uh, are different are formed by the uh, by the gray matter uh, different voxels in gray matter now so that's a null hypothesis uh, pertaining to very large number of cells and equality of the expected values in all the cells of the high dimensional uh, data structures next step you now take a test statistic that depends on the data at all the elements jointly and again here the fMRI people were first the first thing that they did is they took the maximum over all the voxels of the voxel specific t statistics so by taking the maximum of the t statistics you basically combine all the evidence across the volume that you have recorded and later they came up with so called cluster level cluster type statistics where they uh, they first started by thresholding the voxel specific uh, t statistics yeah. so they said i will only look at um, uh, voxels which have a t statistic that is say larger than 2.5 and then i will start clustering these uh, voxels which all exceed that threshold value i will look for contiguous clusters in space which you can also do uh, across space and time if you uh, collect spatial temporal eeg data you form clusters uh, and you can then calculate the size of each of these contiguous clusters and as your test statistic you can take the largest the number of elements in the largest cluster yeah. so there are different ways to combine the information at the level of individual voxels at the level of individual time frequency uh, um, space or electrode points the different ways of combining information across the different physical dimensions that make up your data structure and it's important to, to think about this how you do this there are many options and they will strongly influence your sensitivity and I will return to that in a minute so you can come up with some test statistic and there are m basically the test statistic that you choose it is uh, the sky is the limit you can just think about any test statistic that you want of course at the end you do, you do need a reference distribution yeah? and that, that may become difficult now I'll return to that in the next slide so you can you take some test statistic yeah? Yeah, which you think is sensitive to the uh, to the pattern in which you are interested and now for that test statistic you find the critical value such that under the null hypothesis here is the null hypothesis under that null hypothesis the probability of exceeding this critical value is controlled yeah. basically it's just the same as in the scalar case except that we have blown it up huh? the null hypothesis is more wieldy it pertains to high dimensional expected values in high dimensional data structures the test statistic is more complicated because it has to integrate or combine information across the many different elements in these high dimensional data structures and of course yeah, you need some way to find that critical value um, so here comes the evaluation of the uh, the way Neyman Pearson deals with multiple comparison problem first the distribution of a test statistic under the null hypothesis is only known under auxiliary assumptions and they may be false and the auxiliary assumption that people make in this field and this is this is driven by uh, fMRI data analysis uh, work is so-called Gaussian random field or the um, or the student random field you have many different uh, random fields uh, and they're all characterized um, uh, mathematically and if the assumptions of these Gaussian random Gaussian or student T random fields if they hold uh, then for some test statistics, such as the maximum t, eh, you can calculate 
the uh, critical value. Not for all test statistics, but for some test statistics. Eh? And if you assume the Ga uh, Gaussian uh, random field to hold, you can come up with a critical value. And under that assumption, under that auxiliary assumption, uh, that will control your false alarm rate. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now, here, I, I, read, I wrote a slide a few years ago that those assumptions may be false, and what we recently know is that those assumptions are typically horribly false. So maybe some of you also following the literature in the fMRI community, there is a paper two years ago by Anders Eklund that really created a stir. It's actually it showed that uh, a very large number of published results is likely to be a false positive. And it's all the result of the fact that this Gaussian random field uh, uh, is a poor approximation of the um, uh, 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 probabilistic behavior of these uh, t-statistics in a high dimensional volume. In particular, there is no homogeneity across space uh, with respect to the variance and the correlation between neighboring voxels. It's a, it's a very big literature. I don't know all of it also, but it's, uh, the, uh, uh, the point here is that the auxiliary assumption that you have to make uh, in the high dimensional case uh, is potentially very harmful. And the central limit theorem doesn't help us here. That's the big problem. Central limit theorem doesn't help us. Uh, 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 even if you have a large number of subjects, Typically, it even gets worse. In all these simulations done by Eklund, if you go from 20 to 40 subjects under the null hypothesis, the false alarm rate control gets worse. Yeah. So it's really a big problem, yeah. especially for the fMRI people, because they have been relying on this for years. Second point, now not with respect to false alarm rate control, but with respect to sensitivity. Here, you must choose a test statistic um, uh, that has high power. Uh, it doesn't make sense if you have a test statistic that controls the false alarm rate, but it's not powerful. Uh, you, you need a test statistic that's powerful. Yeah. Okay. Um, <coughs> okay. I, ha I now have a short, a short intermezzo. I have to introduce you the difference between um, uh, between unit of observation and within unit of observation designs. And that is not because this is so important for the concepts, but it is important for practice. So in practice, when we, when we deal with uh, the experiments we do are either one of the two classes, and the statistical tests that we perform are also slightly different for the two classes. So I have to introduce this distinction now. And after this distinction, I will, I will move on to the permutation-based approach. So in neuroscience, the observed data are uh, either a collection of trials, yeah. that's what we have when we do a single subject study, or they're a collection of subjects. It's a multi-subject study. And in the following, we will use the concept unit of observation, or the, the term unit of observation, to denote either trials or subjects. The second thing you have to know is that there are two possible experimental designs. There are so-called between unit of observation designs and there are within unit of observation designs. Now, in a between unit of observation design, every unit of observation, either a trial or a subject, is observed in only a single experimental condition. Whereas in a within unit of observation design, every unit is observed in all experimental conditions. So the first one, let's, let's give an example. Uh, a between unit of observation design, and if the units are trials, that's what you have when you give a subject two types of trials, say, say with an attentional cue and without an attentional cue, and you compare the two sets of trials within that subject. You have a between participants design, it's also between unit of observation design, if you have patients and controls, young and old. Trained subjects, untrained subjects, uh, novices and experts, uh, uh, patients which are at risk for developing a particular disease and patients which are not at risk. Uh, 
And uh, this for, for the, from a statistical point of view, whether the units are trials or subjects doesn't matter. Uh, the, stati the, the, statistician, the statistics doesn't know where the numbers come from. The numbers can come from trials or the numbers can come from subjects. Uh, for the calculation, it doesn't matter. Now next, within unit of observation design, typically these are within participant designs. There are within trials designs, they are rare, I'll come to that later, but within participant design, it's very well known. But I think the majority of the studies in cognitive neuroscience are within participants. So you have multiple participants and every participant is observed in multiple experimental conditions. So every participant brings multiple data sets, one uh, data sets in condition A and data sets in condition B. In a between unit, in a between participants design, that is different. Yeah. There, every, every participant brings only one data set. Yeah. If you are a patient, you bring yours, and if I am a control, I bring mine. I have one. Yeah. I'm not observed in my patient <coughs> condition and in my control condition. So it's manipulated between participants. Now, a within unit of observation design can also be a, a within trial design. That is what you have if you compare a pre-stimulus baseline uh, with a post-stimulus response. That's a within trial design. Yeah. Then you have basically you have one trial, uh, one, one segment prior to, the, uh, prior to the event and the other second after the event. You can evaluate whether there is a difference, whether there is a, an effect of the event that you induced. Okay. Now, what I now do is, I, 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 uh, on this slide, I will point your attention to the minor changes that are required to deal with the within unit of observation design. Actually, th and the, actually the only difference actually pertains to the lower right here. Uh, so, in, uh, in comparison with a between unit of observation design, in a within unit of observation design, the structure of my data and my random variables is different. Remember that in a between unit of observation I had for ev I had for every sorry I had one long vector one long vector of numbers I had small n numbers for condition A and small n numbers for condition B and now in a within unit of observation design my observations are paired huh? so here I have say one participant one participant two until participant n and every participant brings me two numbers one in condition A, one in condition B. Yeah. So th the structure of the data is different, yeah, but the logic is the same. There also is this test statistic S here, but this is not the two sample T test now, it is the paired samples T test, or also the dependent samples T test. That's one that you calculate in a different way as a between samples T test. It's a, it's a way of calculating that takes into account that these numbers are paired. <coughs> it's not really important to know how exactly it's calculated. It's just a different t-statistic. It's a t-statistic that, that, that respects the fact that the data come in pairs. The two-sample t-statistic does not assume the data to come in pairs. Actually, it assumes the data to come as independent observations. Whereas the two sample T statistic assumes that they come in pairs. It's the only difference. The rest of the logic is the same. Okay. The permutation based approach. Uh, this is here the concepts are different. Uh, f let's say a few concepts are very different, but the logic is also very similar. Now we'll focus on where where the differences are. And, and the differences have big consequences for practice. Small differences, big consequences. So, um, you start out with a null hypothesis. Crucially, that null hypothesis is not about expected values. That null hypothesis is about the probability distributions of the observations. Yeah. So the null hypothesis states that the probability distributions of the observations in the different experimental conditions are identical. Yeah. So just assume, so what, you, what you're interested in is evaluating the null hypothesis that the probability distribution that generated your condition A data is the same probability distribution as the one that generated your condition B data. That probability distribution may be very high dimensional, very difficult thing to, 
to conceive. Just assume that they're, they're identical. By the way, this is actually also what the Neyman Pearson approach assumes, except that they use auxiliary assumptions to create, th to create this identity. So they, they formulate the null hypothesis at the level of the expected values, and then they assume some auxiliary assumptions eh, to also create identity between the two conditions. So they're actually playing this game of dissociating the aspect of interest, which is the expected values, from the aspects which are not of interest, which are captured in the auxiliary assumptions. Here, in the permutation approach, we're not separating them. We just take it together. We take, we say, the, the whole probability distribution, eh, that is our thing of interest, and if there is an effect of the independent variable, then this effect will manifest itself as a difference in the probability distributions from which we draw our data in the two experimental conditions. Th that's a different starting point. Now for the rest, it's very much the same. You take some test statistic, yeah? <coughs> and, for and you find a critical value for that test statistic. A critical value for the test statistic such that under the null hypothesis, this one here, the probability of exceeding the critical value is controlled. Importantly, this critical value is defined by some critical p-value under the permutation distribution. So this is a new distribution. So we don't have the sampling distribution here, we have the permutation distribution. It's also a reference distribution. Yeah. It's a reference distribution that we do not have to derive analytically by means of mathematical proof. It's a reference distribution that we can construct ourselves. Yeah? And I, I will explain you in a minute how you can construct this distribution for yourself. The important thing is that we can use that distribution to calculate the p-value, yeah? and if we take a decision on the basis of that p-value, then we control the false alarm rate under that null hypothesis. Yeah. So the fact that you make up your own permutation distribution in it of itself, it doesn't mean anything. Uh, the only thing that's really ev important to evaluate the power or the validity of your method is that you must be able to show that the p-value under that permutation distribution allows you to make a valid inference about that null hypothesis. Yeah. And that is something that can be proved. Now, what are the differences with the Neyman Pearson approach? I already mentioned them briefly. First of all, the null hypothesis is about the whole probability distribution of the observations and not about unknown population parameters. That's one. Second, the p-value under the permutation distribution, you can calculate it for every test statistic without any auxiliary assumption. This is because you don't need the sampling distribution you can produce the permutation distribution yourself. You can ask your computer to do that. And you will do this later in the afternoon. You ask the computer to generate me a permutation distribution for that particular test statistic. And just the, the computer constructs say, an approximation of your permutation distribution. And under that permutation distribution, you calculate your p-value. You can ask the computer to do this for any test statistic. And this is interesting, especially for high-dimensional data. And especially if you have some ideas about what type of effect you are looking for. If you are looking for a particular effect, you can use prior information about that effect. You put this in your test statistic. If you are hunting for a particular effect, but you have not yet collected your data, using the permutation approach, you can use any test statistic that you think is useful, that is sensitive uh, for detecting the effect of interest. You, you think about that test statistic, you implement this in a small function, and you ask field trip or some other package, you ask it, now produce me this permutation distribution, get your p-value, and that p-value, you take a decision on it, it controls the false alarm rate under the null hypothesis for any test statistic. And that's actually point three. I, I, I combined point two and, and point three. 
if you have an, a, a particular interest in a particular pattern in the data that you want to identify, choose your test statistic accordingly. Okay. <coughs> Are you still fresh? It's okay? Okay, there's now, there's one conceptual um, hurdle to be taken, and then the rest is all easy. The rest is easy. But this here, there is one conceptual hurdle. There's a conditional probability distribution here. And I have to tell you, s I will tell you something about it. Um, um, if it doesn't land immediately, it also has been written down in a text. But it's a conceptual thing. It's a, it's a nice conceptual thing that is basically at the heart um, of the false alarm rate control by a permutation test using any an arbitrary test statistic. Okay, I will do this now for the two sample for a between unit of observation design. <coughs> the argument for a within unit of observation design, it's it's along the same lines. So we um, so we have this uh, so we have the same legend as we had for the uh, parametric approach, but the difference is now here. The difference is here because remember in the parametric approach we here we had that um, we draw data from two experimental conditions with equal expected values and with particular auxiliary assumptions. Yeah. So that was, that was the null hypothesis here in this rectangle. Now the null hypothesis is different. It's a bit more abstract. Keep in mind that what we want to test is identical probability distributions in the two experimental conditions. Yeah. So we say that these uh, random variables... Yeah, are identical to these random variables. Yeah. That's our null hypothesis of interest. Yeah. Yeah. So they're uh, basically all 2n random variables, they're all identical. They can have different realizations, of course, yeah. but the probability distribution that generates each of these 2n realizations, those probability distributions, they're all identical. So that's our null hypothesis. And under that null hypothesis, yeah, yeah, we are going to uh, produce a reference distribution that will allow us to take a decision about whether that null hypothesis holds. Yeah. The question now is, how can we make use of that null hypothesis to generate data under that null hypothesis. Generating data under the null hypothesis yeah, that allow us to produce a useful reference distribution. So it's not a sampling distribution. Uh, for the sampling distribution for the neyman pearson approach, we were also thinking about replications, but those replications were part of a mathematical proof uh, showing that this T statistic has a T distribution under the null hypothesis. So here it's different. So what we do here is we use, uh, we, 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 we focus on a conditional probability distribution. We take as a starting point that we will, we will draw data from a conditional distribution. It's the conditional distribution of the uh, data given the un- ordered data. Now you see here these uh, ampersands. Uh, these I use these ampersands to denote the unordered data. These two n numbers, they're ordered. Uh, uh, this one comes before that one, for that one, for that one, for that one. Uh, now, and, and that's why I also have these square brackets here. I'm sorry, I used ampersands, but these are curly brackets, curly braces. They're curly braces, sorry. Don't use this word too often. They're curly braces, and these are square brackets. So in square brackets, the order matters, but here, in between the curly braces, the order doesn't matter. Yeah. So what I denote here actually is a set. This, this D with the curly braces is a set, and in a set, yeah, the order doesn't matter. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw from the conditional distribution of the ordered data given the unordered data. 
That's what I'm going to do. And now ask yourself, what if the null hypothesis holds? Yeah? If the null hypothesis holds that all of these random variables have the same probability distribution, the order doesn't matter. Yeah? Yeah? If the null hypothesis is false, yeah? if that probability distribution is different from the condition B probability distribution, then the ordering is not irrelevant, then, then the ordering is relevant. But under the null hypothesis, the ordering is irrelevant. Now, if the ordering is irrelevant, then every draw from this conditional distribution, ordered data, given unordered data, is equally likely. It doesn't matter. Huh? If they come from the same distribution, all the, pr the conditional distribution of ordered given unordered is a uniform distribution, equal probability. And a uniform distribution, that's a very simple one. Huh? The probability of one draw from a uniform distribution, that probability is just equal to 1 over the total number of permutations possible. And that's where the name comes from, permutation distribution. So basically what we do is we draw from that conditional distribution which under the null hypothesis is a uniform distribution. From a uniform distribution it's trivially easy to sample. Mm. Yeah. Any, any software package has a random number generator that uh, allows you to draw from a uniform distribution. So we draw from this uniform distribution and then the rest of the story is the same as for Neyman Pearson inference. Except that we are not deriving the reference distribution, we are constructing it. We are constructing it by random draws from this conditional distribution. And we again calculate the p-value, take a decision on the basis of the p-value. Yeah. So at an abstract level, the logic is just the same. But the implementation is different. The implementation is different because we have a different null hypothesis and also the distribution from which we draw. Eh? In the Neyman Pearson approach, they draw from this distribution. They, they draw from the distribution of D under the null hypothesis. <coughs> we draw from the conditional distribution. And it turns out that conditioning on these uh, unordered data does not affect in any way the false alarm rate control. If you want to know more about that, there's some stuff written about it. But this is a, this is the intuition. I've got a question about the critical value. Yeah. So in a lot of papers, the 95th percentile is regarded as the critical value yeah. uh, above which you say that the yeah. that your result is significant, which would actually correspond to a one-paired test statistic. Yeah. Uh, a one-sided. Yeah. Yeah. One-sided. Um, in future, I, I think it's implemented that it's corrected for the tails. So um, if you say you have a critical value of 5% and you have a, a two-tailed test, yeah. it, then the actual percentile would be 97.5. How, how problematic do you think is this? Uh, it's not, yeah. Uh, um, these tail probabilities, um, they are confusing. They are confusing in the context of um, uh, cluster-based permutation. Because what we're doing there is we're clustering only within one tail. That's something you have to keep in mind. That when we cluster, uh, uh, we only cluster T statistics that have the same sign. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, um, what I'm asking you now is actually to think away from the one versus two tailed discussion that you know from uh, Neyman Pearson. Mm. Yeah. Because, because, because that will lead you astray if you keep thinking from, uh, from Neyman Pearson. Okay, and uh, the, the reason why Fiedrup uh, corrects for these two tails is that it normally calculates both positive as well yeah, as yeah. negative clusters. But Fiedrup actually has his Bonferroni correction. That's what Fiedrup does. Precisely. That's it. Yeah. 
Yes. Yeah, that's the way to look at it. So you, so you also, uh, di you also uh, divide by two, the, the critical value, just what you do with Bonferroni. Yeah? So, but, but the motivation of dividing by two comes from the bon Bonferroni inequality. It does not come from the two-sided uh, nature uh, in the scalar observation case. So this two-sided test actually only makes sense when you have scalar observations. Yeah. Yeah, maybe the labeling is correct, but I know we have been working on the document. This is a documentation thing, and then there maybe we can improve. And I, by hearing you talk, I now also see you you, uh, you approached you approach this from your knowledge of uh, classical Neyman Pearson inference, and there indeed the words tails are important. You either have one tail or two tail. For cluster-based inference, the concept of a tail, huh, it's not relevant there because we. When we do clustering, we always do clustering on one tail. It's always clustering the positive ones and clustering the negative ones. Then we have two tests, yeah, positive for which we have to correct. That's the logic. We could improve the documentation, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, to the question, you mentioned the correction. I, I'm familiar with the term, but I really like I don't know exactly what it means. But to understand your answer on this question, could you maybe shortly explain what the yeah. So this is. Uh, it belongs to the. Yeah. It's you. Uh, it's 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 um. It's the simplest way of correcting for multiple comparisons. Yeah. So if you do, uh, say if you. D uh, let's let's take the il uh, electrophysiologic uh, example. Say you have uh, 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 275 by a thousand spatial uh, arrays of uh, magnetic fields, collected to the MG system, compare them between two conditions, and you can do this by calculating a t-statistic for each of those 200 and, uh, uh, 275,000 cells in those two matrices. So you're performing 2,000... Uh, uh, so you're performing 275,000 tests. Now, you can prove that you control the false alarm rate if you are performing these, this large number of tests, if you perform this not at the nominal alpha level of 0.05, but you perform them at the alpha level of 0.05 divided by 275,000. So if you have a pocket calculator, you can calculate 275,000 can divide 0.05 by 275,000. Uh, you get an extremely small number. Yeah? And now, if one of these this large number of tests exceeds that very small number, then you say there is a significant difference. So this is an approach which perfectly controls the false alarm rate. It has one big disadvantage. What do you think? What? It's extremely insensitive. It's extremely, uh, you can, it's extremely insensitive. That's why people are not using it, except if you have a low number of tests which you perform. Like in, in field trip, we have the positive and the negative clusters. Those are only two tests that you, and you divide by two. But if you have to divide by 275,000, yeah. Yeah. You're not the only one. <laughs> I'm sorry, what? <coughs> yeah. Yep. I was setting the alpha for uh, the uh, not cast level statistics, but uh, for the T test, zero point. Oh, that, that's a threshold level. Yeah, but that was set because it was a two tailed test. Should it be a two tailed test? Or should I use the. Is this alpha trash that you use? Yeah. Alpha trash, the value that you put in there is totally irrelevant for the false alarm rate control. It's totally irrelevant. Alpha trash is just something that you use 
to threshold your uh, raw T statistics such that you can subsequently cluster. Yeah, exactly. It's actually it's a, it's a part of the T statistic. Mm -hmm. It has it has no impact on the false alarm rate control. The false alarm rate control is at the level of the cluster level statistic, which is in our case the maximum cluster sum test, and it's for the and it's the maximum cluster sum test which is here on the horizontal axis. So it's not an individual T statistic that you have here. Here you have the, the sum of the, so, so the here you have the largest uh, positive cluster <coughs> or alternatively the largest negative cluster. So you have two tests here. So those are here depicted. So it's not individual T statistics that are up there. That's also what you had in mind. That, yeah? Yeah? For alpha trash, only the sensitivity determines. So if you change alpha trash, you, you change your sensitivity. So assume that you would take this threshold value. Let me say, I'm going to wait because you, you are a user of field trip. And actually, I'm talking now about the rest of my talk. We'll come to that. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. Let's get back. Yeah, 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 yeah. That, that, that's that, that's that, that's the, that's the logic from for drawing from this conditional distribution. Yeah, now you're back on track, and all the discussion with him, and with 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 her, and with Robert, that was totally, <coughs> totally inspired by the fact that this distribution had one tail, yeah? whereas in practice, it must have one tail because it's either positive clusters, the, the maximum positive cluster, or, then I put the tail at the other side, it's the uh, smallest negative cluster. Yeah? yeah. And just to pick up on the same thread that we're trying to get back to, is that the same as saying um, the order doesn't matter? Is that the same as saying the data is equally probable from either condition? That's it. That's the same thing. You can also say, from the data, I cannot predict uh, from which condition it came. Same thing. Same thing. That's the concept. That's the concept. The data do not discriminate between a different condition. That's my null hypothesis. Yeah. If you start thinking in these concepts, permutation inference is the natural thing to do. It's also easy. Yeah. Yeah. And you don't need mathematical statisticians. You can do everything yourself. Okay, now let's come to the calculation of these uh, cluster-based t-statistics and the thresholding. I didn't know I was so close to answering your question because it's actually it's actually on the next slide. So, what I'm going to sure. No, I don't. We have a lot of trials. Yeah. And then we average or yeah. whatever do. Yeah. Then we have. Uh, sure. We yeah. So it, it seems like you ignore trials level when you do um, the no. accommodation based within your own design. No, I'm not. It, it all depends on where your interest is. So when you collect data from multiple subjects, then uh, basically there are two ways in which you can go about with your analysis and in the afternoon you will do both so you can start by looking at every individual subject independently and then you're you you're doing a, a between trials analysis so you want to evaluate for each individual subject uh, is uh, uh, does the null hypothesis of equal condition means uh, so uh, uh, sorry does the null hypothesis of equal probability distributions for the A trials and the B trials, does that null hypothesis hold? And you can evaluate that null hypothesis for every subject individually. Uh, so this, this is a null hypothesis at a single subject level. And you may find out that some subjects show a very uh, significant difference between A and B. Some subjects may show no difference. And there may, e may even be a few subjects that show it the other way. 
difference in the other direction. Yeah. So, and looking at the different subjects and evaluating the significance of these uh, subject-specific effects already gives you some idea about what is going on. So, do the subjects show the same effects or should they show different effects? So, what are my chances of getting something significant if I would now go to the second level? And the second level, that in that's a within unit of observation design. Yeah? So, in the second level, you're not looking at the trials anymore, but you're just averaging the data or the, the, the output of your spectral analysis. You average this over the trials within every condition. And then, for every, sub for every subject, you again get data which are now trial averages within the conditions. Yeah? And that's all work that you do in field trip, uh, uh, so it's, it's pre-processing pre pre and uh, time lock averaging that you do, uh, in which you do uh, within every subject. Uh, and then the output data are the input for uh, uh, cluster-based statistic which for which you use a paired samples t-test. And then you test the null hypothesis which pertains uh, to the population of the participants, not trials. Yeah. So then we ignore the within yeah, the, yeah, that's what you do. And that's also what you should do. You should ignore the within subject variance. Because you want your inference to depend on the variance across the subjects, not within the subject. Ah, yeah. Can we you come from language, yeah. yeah <coughs> between design between the items within a condition, for example, yeah. if some word is acting weird, for example, yeah. it's also possible then to do within, uh, between design, within a condition, within one subject. Now, the analysis, uh, you, can have, you cannot have two random effects in the same design. So, either, uh, so if, if you do this for, for the psycholinguist, you have the opportunity to also look at your items mm -hmm. as your unit of observation. Either you have your subject as your unit of observation, or you have your item as unit of observation. Mm -hmm. yeah? And in this case, can you, for example, just test separate subjects like by random draw with a between design between the items within a condition just to have a look at whether they are acting normally so that you can just discard something and then put them within the unit of observation design. So you're testing for an effect of items. Exactly. So I if you can't put it in a, in a, in a great statistics... Do you have replications? Is the same item being presented multiple times? Um, you have the same condition with different items and you want to discard the items, for example, that mm. are... Let's have a sandwich together because this is very specific for language. It's very specific. I, I know the problems. Yeah, I have to. So Eric is also going to be available during yeah. the hands-on session, so we could also and, and for the coffee break. So we yeah, the yeah. this is specific for your context. Yeah, let's move on. Yeah, so oh, we're almost done, by the way. Yeah, so this let me take you through uh, how you actually, uh, yeah, how you build such a uh, such a test. And 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 I, and and I would like to focus on the fact that you can choose your test statistic yourself, uh, and that's why I call this a homemade test statistic. <laughs> I call it a homemade test statistic because it is inspired by what we know about the biophysics uh, of the uh, electrophysiological signal. So we, without knowing anything about the content domain where these data come from, we d we do have some expectations with respect to the spatial, spectral, temporal uh, structure of uh, plausible effects. I will come to that. And it's actually the main motivation for the clustering. So these are the data you will also be analyzing. And I, I simplified it. So this is the data from one MEG channel, a left temporal channel. And this is, an this is a language experiment. It's an N so called, it's the magnetic N400 experiment. So you know the N400, Marta, we have the even have the Marta Cutas room here. But then we here we did we did an, a magnetic version of the uh, N400. It turns uh, uh, this is the effect that you get exactly nicely centered at 400 milliseconds after uh, the incongruent sentence ending. And there are of course there are two types of trials: there are congruent trials and there are incongruent trials. Uh, and you see that this this evoked response is only there in the incongruent trials. Uh. Now here you might say, ah, oh, this is I can already see it by eyeballing. Uh, 
So it's so cl it's so clear. But let's now let's take this as an example to perform a statistical test. And how would we go about if we do this non-parametrically? So we have a time axis. Yeah? So we only have a one, uh, only have a temporal dimension. To extend this to spatial temporal or spatial spectral temporal, it's all along the same lines. But just keep it simple here. So here we have it, we have a total of 1,200 uh, 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 time points because we had the data were downsampled to 600 hertz. Uh, and then we have so we have two time series of the raw data, or raw data. Sorry, two time series. The average. These are the, the averages over the trials within the conditions. And this second plot. These are the time point specific t statistics. And the t statistics they depend not only on the uh, difference between the average of those two lines, but also on the uh, within condition variances. So the variances over the trials within the conditions they also go go into the calculation of the t statistic. So we now have t statistics. We have a t-statistic time series. Now coming to, uh, to, to your question. So we are having t-statistics here, and then many people start thinking, oh, but you're doing it in a parametric inference anyhow. You're doing, you're doing permutation inference, but you're using a t-statistic. So you're actually, it's a kind of a mixed form of statistics. It's mixed parametric, a mi uh, a mixed non-parametric. Now the answer is, it's fully non-parametric. We only use those t statistics because they're a convenient <coughs> quantification they're a convenient index for thresholding yeah? so what we want wh what we want is we want to do clustering that's the objective the clustering and the, the clustering that we want to do requires thresholding but the motivation for the clustering is that we want to quantify our effect and put this in a test statistic in a biophysically plausible way. And we know <laughs> the way the brain works, it works in contiguous chunks over time. So if there is some semantic processing in the brain, it starts at some point, it takes a while, and then it stops. Semantic processing in the brain is not discontinuous in time. It's not the case that we have some semantic processing between 110 and 120 milliseconds. And then we do um, uh, visual analysis from 120 until 270, and then from 270 to 290 we do syntax, and from 290 to 350 we do again semantics. And that's, that's not the way we do this. That's not a computer. That's an assumption. We don't know. That's Good point. That's that's a good point, and that's for up, up for you to challenge. If you think that there is this this type of this type of alternation of type of processing being performed, collect the data. It's going to be tough, but you may be right. But on the basis of what we know, and that, that's what I mean, prior knowledge. Yeah? And there, I agree with the Bayesians. The Bayesians say you must make use of all the prior knowledge that you have to optimize your inference. And they do this by putting that information in the, pr in the prior distribution. And there is a lot of discussion about whether or not they're overweighting the value of the prior information. In this approach, you cannot overweight the value of your prior information. Yeah? If you have good reason that, uh, that processing occurs according to a particular scheme, in my I, I assume uh, a contiguous scheme, unless you come up with a revolutionary study showing that, that uh, visual, syntactic, and semantic processing is discontinuous, until that time, I will take it continuous, and then I go for clustering. If I want to do clustering, I must threshold. The question now is, how is the threshold? And for thresholding, only for thresholding, I borrow a statistic from the, my friends, the parametric statisticians. I just use a regular t-statistic, and I threshold it at a value that they would consider reasonable. And, and here I use alpha thresh yeah, corresponding to uh, an alpha level of 0.05. But if I would use a different threshold value, this would not affect the type 1 error rate of my permutation inference. The size of the yes, it affects the sensitivity. Here it comes. This is, this is what it does. If I take a very high threshold value, uh, then I will improve my sensitivity for 
small, uh, so not temporally extended, but uh, but um, uh, lar but, but s st strong effects which are not temporally extended. If I take a low threshold, I will bias my sensitivity to weak but temporally widespread effects. So it's a sensitivity thing. you will get a different output, for sure. But the false alarm rate control is not affected. That's the point. So you, even if you have this for transporting alpha 0 0.0.5 instead of 0.05, yeah. uh, you still should correct uh, your final cluster level statistics or positive and negative clusters. That's always, yeah. yeah. A positive and negative is independent of the alpha trash value that you choose. Yep. But that is the basis of Edwin's paper, right? Higher cluster um, forming threshold. Yeah. It actually lead to a higher form positive. So they suggest. No, 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 no. So for first, Eklund, it's all it's it's inference uh, using Gaussian random field, yeah? and so the the the, the fact that uh, uh, packages <coughs> like <coughs> sorry. Yeah, let's have a talk about this. Uh, no, only a lot to be said about this. But 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 definitely the the, the under the parametric framework, increasing the threshold improves uh, false alarm rate control. In the non-parametric framework, the uh, the height of the threshold is uh, n does not play a role at all in the false alarm rate control. False alarm rate is controlled regardless of the value of the threshold. Yes? I don't know the Eklund paper in detail, so it's just uh, uh, regarding random field theory. Yeah, yeah. And uh, there the problem is that if you're in cooking, uh, so if you... It's about the asymptotics. It's about the, the validity. It says, how well can you trust Gaussian random field theory? And, and you can trust it for high thresholds, not for low thresholds. Yeah. Uh, okay, so here we have our uh, we have our we have uh, we have a number of clusters here. Uh, only the biggest one is uh, is uh, is great here, yeah? and what we uh, what we uh, what we what we uh, what we choose as our test statistic is the area under this uh, uh, under this uh, T signal, the area under this T signal uh, that is that has the largest surface area. There, there are a number of small ones here, <coughs> huh? and they, they're also, they're also uh, connected clusters, but they're smaller. Huh? And that's depicted visually here, too. Here are the different clusters. Um, this is uh, the size of the, uh, of the cluster that will eventually be used as the, final, as the outcome of the final test statistic, and for which we will um, produce uh, the permutation distribution, and on which we will base the p-value. What I also put it in is uh, the bomb. Uh, the uh, it's it's the it is the uh, time points which are significant after Bonferroni correction. Yeah, and here you may be surprised. Hey, this is surprisingly large. Eh? Eh? That it's it's good. Bonferroni is performing quite well. But I also did the same analysis, not with one channel, but with 275 channels. And then Bonferroni uh, told me that there is no difference, there is, there is no magnetic N400. That's what they told me. So here in words, what you do is, oh sorry, so, so this is what you observe. This is the observed data. And what you see on the right hand side, that is what you get if you do uh, a random permutation of the trials between the semantically congruent and the semantically incongruent condition. Yeah. Yeah. So you have a few hundred trials incongruent, few hundred, I say a hundred, a hundred incongruent, a hundred uh, congruent. Yeah. And basic, basically what you do, you put all of these trials in one pot, you, 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 uh, you mix them, and you randomly partition them. And for every random partition, you make uh, a pseudo-incongruent and a pseudo-incongruent uh, time series. <laughs> 
and because of course they are uh, randomly constructed so you will only see random differences between the dashed which are the randomly assigned con congruent trials and the solid the randomly assigned incongruent lines now you do the same thing for the, 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 the t statistics and what you will see is random fluctuations of that t statistic signal around zero and they will exceed the 5% univariate critical values only in 5% of the samples. This is something I know from uh, Neyman Pearson inference, and here I assume that the central limit theorem uh, helps me out. Yeah. 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 Uh, so, there, yeah. so, un so under the permutation distribution, this is fluctuating around zero. Yeah. And uh, yeah, because it's fluctuating around zero under the permutation distribution, there will be far less uh, of these large clusters <coughs> than what you have in my than what you have in your observed data. Okay, yeah. let me ask you first because. Yeah. I think field trip now gives this in as an output. If you, because you, so you have to sample, uh, uh, say I think what's the default? Now you have a thousand or five hundred? Five hundred is. Actually, I'm not sure what the default is. Is either five hundred or a thousand? Yeah. If you have a very, if you have a group of five subjects, the only way in, in which you can get a significant result uh, is so the smallest value you can get is uh, um, I think it's it's point oh four eight. Yeah. yeah. So No, five, but five you can get significance. Yeah, but then they all, they all must show the effect in the same direction. So with five you have significance if you have an intraocular positive result. Yeah, <laughs> that's what you can say. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep. Yep. The initial threshold is something you decide a priori. Or you can put in whatever you want. The thing, the requirement for this thresholding is that you need some statistic which you can apply at the, in this case, uh, for every uh, time bin, you must be able to apply and to threshold it in a reasonable way. The reason why we took the T-stick is, is we, we have a reasonable way to threshold it, that's all. And you can use Wilcoxon, no problem. So this is this is a between trials design this. Okay. Yeah. <coughs> only run on one subject. Yeah. You will do this analysis in the afternoon. Okay. 
Yeah, you, then you cal what you then do is you have, uh, f for, ev for every subject, so you have, uh, so I have this now for one subject, these averages, but in practice I think we had about 15 subjects, and each of these 15 subjects has these two time series. And now we are going to evaluate over subjects, whether there is a difference between congruent and incongruent, and then we do this uh, with a uh, paired samples t-test, and that corresponds to a within unit of observation design. It's the question that you asked before. Right. So it's, it's in the hands-on session, we will be working both on a within subjects uh, statistical test and a, and a group statistical test. And I think that, it, that, that this is best addressed once we Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I think it will become much more clear if you, if you see the tutorial. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> as long as if it's not specific for your own research question. No. It's then, yeah, okay. Yeah. So here you're calculating a pair t-test between the two lines. No, independent samples. It's, be it's between trials. Okay, but you're directly comparing the two conditions. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. you also calculate a one sample t-test for each condition against zero? No. 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 No, that, that, that's, that would violate that would violate the principle because what we're the null hypothesis we're testing is that the data <coughs> from condition A come from the same probability distribution as the data from condition B. But there is no but something that we can test here is similar to what you're asking for. Yeah. That is whether the data from the uh, what the, pro the probability distribution of the data would be the same as the probability of the data if we flip the data. Because if we take zero, so if we take the data minus the baseline, or if we take the baseline minus zero, what we're actually doing is we're, we're flipping the data. So that, that is a trick that we're sometimes using in a way of a sign test, mm -hmm. flipping the sign of the data by, by using surrogate data, which, is the, which contains the baseline. Yeah. We have this in the activation versus baseline condition. So we, th that's what, so activation versus baseline t-test, we call it. It's a stat in and field trip. And basically, you use it to test the null hypothesis that the data in, say, say you have an interest in 400 milliseconds, 400 milliseconds uh, after an event like a stimulus. So you want to know whether uh, that stimulus elicits some response in the brain. And you want to evaluate this by comparing 0 to 400 with minus 400 to 0. That is, and then you can do permutation uh, between uh, post-stimulus and pre-stimulus. And that is actually, it's a within trials. So if you do this in, within one subject, it's a within trials experimental design. And if you do this with multiple subjects, it's a within participants. Yeah. But there is no real zero, there is activation versus baseline. A and B are now activation and baseline. Where where line Sorry, where, where, where? <coughs> this one? Yeah, the, 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 you know, yeah. Be the careful with the baseline here. If I, if I, these data are high pass filtered, if, if I <laughs> have different high pass filtered, they, it would look differently. Yeah. So when you compare the, the black line against the zero line, yeah. then there seems to be a cluster between 400 and 800 milliseconds. So just, just a clarification, yeah. in the second figure, the black line is not uh, compared to best okay. versus baseline, the black line, black uh. line is the T line. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With a di direct comparison between the, two conditions. Yeah. between the two conditions. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And if you compare the, each of the conditions against the zero line w with a one sample t-test, you yeah. would get a cluster for the black line d during 400 milliseconds and 800 milliseconds and a cluster for the dotted line between maybe one second and two seconds. And then I'm wondering whether this is also a it seems, it, seems, it seems that you're, that you're doing two statistics, that you're doing two tests, and that you have two different hypotheses, namely one hypothesis for one condition, and that you have a hypothesis for the other condition. That's two tests. So here we're doing a single test, which is about the comparison mm. of the distribution of probability to uh, the data observed in the condition. Okay. Uh, I, I, it's like uh, we still have quite a schedule ahead of yeah. us. Uh, we're, we're running seriously late. Uh, I think we should now um, stop yeah. the part here, then we move down to the to
coffee area that we have a have a cup of coffee and anyone who has still further questions can ask them there okay and Eric will also be available during the hands-on session so we can continue the discussion but I think we should stop the, yeah. the, the presentation stuff. I'm going to wrap up Robert yeah, yeah? I'm going to see uh, everything on this slide actually I explained uh, by going through the previous figure this is the result of the same test, but now um, uh, spatio-temporal rather than uh, purely temporal. And here Bonferroni gives no uh, significant uh, difference between the two conditions. Oh, a nice thing to see is that the method uh, it produces two clusters. Yeah? It's one positive and one, uh, one negative cluster. And you can now see the dipolar structure in the, um, uh, in the significant clusters. So you have dipole fitting, you can see positive cluster denoting the outgoing magnetic field and negative cluster the ingoing. Or is it the other way around? I think outgoing is positive and ingoing is negative. Yeah. Okay. So so if you compare permutation based and name on Pearson approach to the multiple comparison problem, I think the evaluation is in the favor of the permutation based approach and for two reasons. First, the distribution of the null hypothesis does not depend on any auxiliary assumptions. Yeah. So no Eklund type of problems that we have here. And the second thing is a test statistic, which depends on the data at all samples jointly. You can choose it such that it is maximally sensitive to effects that are biophysically plausible. And it doesn't even have to be only biophysically plausible, it can also be plausible from any frame from which you can take prior, prior uh, information pertaining to where a likely effect is uh, to be observed. So what you should remember here is that statistics is about decision making under uncertainty, that we have to deal with a low SNR in most biological signals and also with an extremely high uh, dimensionality uh, of the data structures. So therefore we cannot do without statistics. Um, uh, every statistical principle that you want to use in neuroscience must be able to solve the multiple comparison problem because that's the main, the chief difference between our use of statistics and the way people in agricultural science and uh, behavioral cognitive science are using statistics. I think permutation tests are ideally suited for this so because they solve the multiple comparison problems without having to uh, uh, make auxiliary assumptions and they increase sensitivity by incorporating biophysically plausible constraints. That's it. Thank you.